Okay, we are back. I'm very happy to have on the Goldstein on Geld show Professor Gary Becker from the University of Chicago and the 1992 winner of the Nobel Prize in Economics. Professor, real pleasure to have you. I'm glad to be here. So some of the work that you've done in economics, which has really been quite novel, is applying the theories of economics to other areas, not the least of which is, is the family. My day job is that I'm a financial planner and I deal with family dynamics a lot. But one of the things I understand that you've argued is that if you look at the family like a small factory, you'll see that they make decisions that are rational. Is that really true? I think it is really true. Um, you know, for the most part, not every decision is rational, but I think people recognize that a lot of decisions made by families, such as when people get married, when they divorce, when they have children, these are some of the most fundamental decisions they make over their lifetime, and I think uh, most people put a lot of thought into those decisions. So how about the, the personal finance issues like why don't people balance their budget and why do they borrow too much on their credit cards? Yeah, well, it, I, I think, again, most people, I think, are, are pretty sensible about it. There are exceptions that will get more, more publicity. I mean, sometimes it pays to borrow, depending upon all circumstances. If you're a young person, you expect your earnings to be higher in the future. You know, it's rational to go into debt, and, and younger people do get to contract a lot of debt, as when they're in school or even early stages of uh, post-school behavior. So that's probably rational. Um, uh, and I think if you, if you look at the bulk of people's behavior, I, I think you find a lot of uh, uh, sense of sense sense to what they're doing, uh, in the sense that one can understand, given their circumstances the uncertainty of facing the future, they make pretty good decisions. Not perfect, I'm not, uh, you know, of course, but pretty good decisions. Do you find that the policies that governments, that the government might make, even for example now, or let's say a few years ago during the housing crisis, which caused people to get very, very easy money and to borrow such huge amounts that they were really making with certainly retrospectively seems to be irrational decisions, and maybe even at the time it was irrational. Well, they were making decisions. You know, some of them turned out to be not, not so good, clearly. But look, you had a lot of sophisticated people in the financial community, that is, investment bankers and so on, who were making a lot of decisions, eventually cost them and their stockholders a lot of money. So uh, if I look at the you know consumer decisions, let's say in some prime borrowers who had low, low, poor credit ratings and low income, they were able to borrow money with very little down payment, very little interest, um, and so there was a great, I think, rational incentive to do so. Now, for some of these people, it turned out when the boom burst, and they were stuck, they, you know, the houses were taken away from them. They enjoyed a, a year or two or longer of pretty cheap living in a house. So um, I think the irrationality was not on the consumer side, but on what governments did in terms of the Federal Reserve and what a lot of investment bankers did. I see. So you're saying that the people themselves, given their specific situation, they individually made rational decisions, even though perhaps from an outside point of view, the whole setup might not have been so wise. Exactly. I think overall they did. You know, there are other there are people who went into debt well beyond anything they could expect to finance. I'm not denying that there there are those examples. But I think for the most part, if you look at the housing boom, I think the individual householder, regardless um, of their education or income, particularly the ones who came in on the easy money, low interest rate, subprime. Uh, uh, environment, I, I think their decisions look pretty good. It's, it's hard to understand what governments were doing and what some of the so-called sophisticated bankers were doing. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I hear that. So let's go back then to the the family unit and looking at it as a factory. In fact, I often like to say that too. I tell my clients, you're like the CEO of your company and you have to make the big picture decisions and you hire a manager to handle the day-to-day -day operations. And I always use this metaphor because I, I like to give people the feeling that they understand that they're in, in control of the big picture and shouldn't worry so much about the details. The problem that I find when I talk to these clients is I'll often hear 
a husband and wife come in and the husband says, yeah, but you spend too much. And she says, well, you know, you don't work hard enough or, you know, some discussion like that. And again, that to me seems rather irrational. Well, there are conflicts you know, within families, but whether it's rational or not, you know, it depends on what, whose point of view you're looking at. So maybe a husband doesn't work so hard because he might expect his wife to make up for it in some ways. And so he's sort of what we call in economics, he's, he's trying to free ride on what she will be doing. So he cuts down what he, what he works. So she spends more because she hopes that will induce him to earn more and um, her interests uh, are not fully meshed with his interests. So you have to recognize what I'm trying to say a little bit convolutedly is that if family is a unit, but that doesn't mean there's no conflict in the family. Just like a company is a unit, but we know there's conflict between stockholders and management, management and law level employees. So there is conflict in families too. But if you look at the end, it may not be rational for the whole unit, but it may be rational for the individual participants in terms of decisions they're making because there are some conflict within families. We are talking with Professor Gary Becker from the University of Chicago. He won the 1992 Nobel Prize in Economics, and he's done a lot of work with taking economic principles and applying them beyond economics. We've been talking a little bit about how the, the family unit can be seen as its own economic unit. Professor, there's kind of a famous story. I think it's about you, and maybe you can tell us if it's true, that one day you were parking your car, and you had a choice because you were kind of in a hurry to either park illegally or to take the long route and look for a garage. And ultimately, the, the story goes that you chose to park illegally because you calculated that the probability of getting caught and the potential punishment didn't compare against the benefit of getting a good, albeit illegal, parking space. So you didn't seem so afraid of the uh, repercussions. So my question to you is, on this show, I had the opportunity to speak to uh, Professor Danny Kahneman about loss aversion. And he said that people really, really hate to lose. I mean, I'm simplifying it. But you seemed not to be afraid of losing in the parking case. So, A, is this a true story? And, B, why do you think there's a difference between the, the way you two looked at human nature? First of all, it is a true story. Okay, um, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I was, on, I was rushing to examine a student, a PhD student, and, um, and that was exactly the kind of calculation I, I made. And more than that, on the basis of that calculation, I then thought about that problem more as a student about it and eventually wrote a fairly well-known paper on what was called crime and punishment and economic approach. So um, it, it led to a publication for me. Now, in terms of the question you're raising, um, uh, you know, I think when people are making small type of calculations like I was doing, it, you know, the fine would not be an impor important uh, amount in terms of my wealth and so on. I think people make the kind of calculations I make for the most part. Um, when people are, are worried about bigger, bigger risks that they're taking, you know, various types, financial risk or, or other risks, yeah, I think they very much worry a lot about losses. I, mean, not, I don't see anything irrational about that. I just think that's the way people are constructed that uh, the fear of losing um, can dominate it often the gain from gaining and so people take that into account. Now, if, you, if I was thinking of my calculation, uh, I might get six months in jail or, or three months in jail and uh, versus some some gain, even though the jail stands with a very low probability event, yeah, I might I might have made a different decision. So you're saying that the, the size of the transaction is what's going to affect whether someone's willing to take the loss as opposed to what Kahneman was talking about, which was perhaps referring to major investments? Yeah, I think I definitely think the size, and I think a lot of work in, in economics and psychology suggests that the size is really important. <laughs> so, you know, as we're saying this, it sounds so obvious. Why would anyone think otherwise? Well, I'm not sure. I mean, uh, I mean, I think people do recognize the, the size of the of, of the losses versus the gain uh, can uh, significantly affect people's decision that they'll behave differently with small small gains and losses. Like, let's say I'm going to go in and 
I spend some money at a casino and uh, spend maybe uh, $25 at a casino with slot machines where the probability of winning is very low, but the enjoyment of just uh, seeing if I can win is big. Yeah, that kind of behavior is going to be very different than what I was talking about. Well, um, if I invest in this company which has very low uh, ratings, um, uh, I may lose my, my whole investment, and that's a big part of my wealth. I'm, I'm going to pay very differently in that situation. Mm-hmm. I, mean, no, I think very few people will deny that. It is common sense, but should we deny common sense? <laughs> I guess that's what economists often look for, is what people just don't realize is right in front of them. So let me wrap up with another theme that you've done a great great amount of research on. In fact, you founded an organization called The Greatest Good in order to help people with philanthropy. So my experience, again, just from my day job as a financial advisor, is that some of the wealthiest people that I know tell me that when things get bad, they increase the amount that they give in charity. You know, whether they're giving 10 or 20 percent or more of their income, they'll up that and some, sometimes they'll quote, you know, from the Bible where it says in the prophets that God says, you know, test me. If you give charity, then I'll give it back to you. This all doesn't sound terribly rational. It sounds perfectly religious and, and um, very nice. But is well, there a mechanism? There, there are some people like that. But, you know, if you look at the behavior of charitable gifts during the, the past crisis and during recessions and when people experience a good time, they generally cut down. I mean, one of the things they cut down fat, uh, quickest is their charitable contribution. Now, there are exceptions um, to that, uh, clearly. Uh, people who, are, um, who are, uh, feel that they have, they, they're obligated to give a fixed amount to some religious or other charity, they may continue to do that. They may even give more because um, they, they think that might help them in the future. But I think if you look at the bulk of people, that, that's what economics deals with. They, they deal with the, the, the bulk of people, not with every single individual. And yeah, contributions, charitable contributions, are very sensitive to the state of the economy, the state of individuals' fortunes. I mean, that's a lot of evidence supporting that. That's interesting. One that's of it, irrational, I think. You're saying that is irrational. No, rational. Rational. If you're wealthy, you know, if your situation is more precarious and you're going to cut down on some things that you can maybe make up late in charity is one of these things you can do. Mm-hmm. You know, it's funny. I, one of the irrational things that I've often thought is that when people donate large sums of money or even small sums, they often don't really care how it gets invested. And I'll say to them something like, you know, if you'd like, we could oversee the donation to make sure that your building gets built or the library gets funded, and they say, no, it's okay, I'm friendly with the principal, or I know what's going to happen. And that same person who's donating a million dollars would look so carefully at every aspect of an investment that he did, let's say if he was buying stocks or bonds. Why do you think there's such a disconnect? Well, it depends on how much confidence he has in the investor. You know, I'm, I'm chairman of an institute at the University of Chicago, and we try to raise money for that institute. And... Um, my experience has been that potential donors look ask a lot of questions, particularly those who are going to make big gifts before they give us a big gift, and they worry a lot about how it's going to be spent. Now, they don't want, want to get involved in the details of how it's spent. I think that's perfectly sensible because let's say if somebody's going to give uh, money to a Department of Economics at my university or, say, Hebrew University or any place else, they don't know enough to know what's a sensible way to spend that money. I mean, they just don't know the details of what it means to recruit students and faculty and the lag research. Uh, so what they're worried about is they have confidence in the person they're giving uh, money to so that those people can make decisions for them. And I think that's far more central decision than the philanthropists who think that they can micromanage successfully a gift to a, a, a university or any other charitable institution because most of the time they really don't know enough to be able to do that very well. They may know a lot in their business, so they mm-hmm. micromanage that carefully. Okay. All right. Listen, we are just about out of time. We have been talking with Professor Gary Becker from the University of Chicago. Uh, Professor, in the last few seconds, just tell me, how can people follow your work? Well, I have a blog called the Becker Post and Blog, so uh, and we 
publish uh, we publish every week a uh, discussion of different articles and I have a website you know, Gary S. Becker, I don't know the exact uh, uh, web address but we have, I have a website where they can follow my work so both those places if they're interested they can follow it okay what we'll do is we'll put a link to those websites on the Goldstein on Gelt website Goldstein on Gelt dot com in the show notes so everyone can find you good thank you all right Professor thanks so much for your time okay. thank you bye You've been listening to the Goldstein on Gelt Show with money maven Doug Goldstein. Doug's weekly radio show is heard around the world, but if you miss it, you can download the podcast at www.goldsteinongelt.com. The Goldstein on Gelt Show gives you up-to-date financial ideas so you can get on the path to financial freedom. If you'd like your questions answered on the air or off, send Doug an email to doug at profile-financial.com. It's your money for your future, so join Doug every week to build your wealth on the Goldstein on Gelt Show.